Hey everybody, it's Ryan. Welcome back to another exciting episode of Eggs. This week we have special guest Melvin Figueroa. Melvin is a web designer, branding expert, and the founder of Mellow Multimedia. For the past decade, Melvin has been working pr- passionately in the design industry, creating brand identities and building websites for small business owners on both local and national scales. Melvin has always believed that websites should be more than something nice to look at and should serve each individual business in a more dynamic way. By understanding his clients' behaviors, pain points, and benefits of the product and service, Melvin is able to create them a website that will act as a 24-7 salesperson and keep take their business to the next level. This past year, Melvin has spoken at Goldman Sachs 1000 Small Business Cohort, as well as Rhode Island Black Business Association about the importance of having strong online presence and how it can make a deep impact on business. So without any further ado, uh, welcome to the show, our guest, Melvin Figueroa. Thank hey, you so Melvin. much for having me. Yeah, not a problem. Of course. Happy to have you on. Sorry uh, if I uh, botched the read a little bit. I may go, I may go back <laughs> and fix it. So for yeah, everybody, it sounds <laughs> better the second time. <laughs> yeah, so for everybody who gets the perfect read when this hits the air, they'll know. They'll know that I went back and fixed it. So uh, anyway, so Melvin, tell us a little bit about yourself. Um, let's just kind of, I guess, start at the beginning. What got you into web development as a career and sort of how'd you get started? Well, uh, that's a good question. Honestly, uh, I actually never thought of myself as an entrepreneur or having even having a business of my own. Uh, but growing up as a kid, I've always been like creative. I've always been somebody who can take something and make it to something else. And I always love the reaction that I would get from people. And so uh, during high product. school, yeah, exactly. You know, <laughs> you kind of see the, the dots connecting a little here. But uh, also when I went to like high school, I started taking some classes at RISD, Rhode Island School of Design, and really fell into like, I fell in love with like digital art and instead of doing it on paper, doing it digitally on a screen. And so from there, I started just transitioning um, into learning more about the web, learning more of what online graphics really mean, and eventually uh, worked for a couple different print design places, a couple different marketing agencies. Um, Then eventually found out that I don't really like working with the boss. (laughs) I like being the (laughs) boss, you know, and I tried it out and I've been on it ever since. That's great. Well, what gave you the courage to be able to step out and go on your own? I I have sort of a similar backstory just in terms of having self-taught myself a lot of the business and and things like that. But like, I mean, for me, it took being laid off from a job, basically. Like I wasn't brave enough to actually step out and start my business on its own. Now we're 15 years deep, 20 years deep, you know, so it's not that big a deal anymore. But uh, I remember those early days, you know, I, I was burning the candle at both ends, working my day job and working at night and all these things. And then eventually, like something had to give and it was my employer who quit me first. (laughs) And so, (laughs) so, uh, so I went out and I started my business. What's your story like? Um, for me, honestly, like I, this, I really believe in like having mentors and having somebody who's further along in the journey than you to learn from. And so every time when I had a job, I taught, I I tried it, I treated it like that basically as if they were like a mentor and had something to teach me. So I've learned and picked up a lot of things from print design from digital marketing to web design, from all these different jobs and different mentors that I've had. Even when I was in high school and college, I had a lot of internships with that too. And so eventually I started just realizing that, you know, being an entrepreneur or at least in the web design and creative world, uh, I could do a lot of this stuff on my own. You know, I didn't, I felt like I didn't need to work a nine to five, you know, in order to, to get that money. Instead, I could have just got my own clients and charge my own rates and, and make a living that way. And so eventually what I would do is just, I would, uh, you know, I would uh, work my nine to five and then just like you, I would work, you know, my side gigs and different projects and eventually it just grew from there, you know? Yeah, that's awesome. Well, what's the the market like up there? I've only been, uh, are you in Providence or outside and around Providence? Yeah, actually a lot of my clientele is from the Providence area, but I have clients from all over and I actually recently moved to Florida. Uh, actually, it was in July is when I made the move down here. See, July is the wrong time to move there, right. but right now is the right time to move there. So, yeah. I mean, if you're from Rhode Island, now is the time to get out, I think. But. Yeah, it's like summer and then like super hot summer. That's all we got here. <laughs> that's awesome. Well, well, cool. So, let's talk a little bit then. So, I mean, clearly you identified a niche and, and that it made sense for you to start doing this work on your own versus doing it for a... a you know, for an employer, a traditional job. Let's talk about your first client. Like, what did it take for you to finally get into your first project? Did it come sort of organically or was it something you sought out? Um, honestly, like I've built a lot of relationships through different jobs and people know that I'm the guy at the end of, you know, at the end of the totem pole here, like doing all this stuff. And so people know that. So I have gotten projects that way. But my first project was, um, 
like I think it was like a family friend or something. It was for like a catering company that that somebody was starting and uh, they needed a logo. And so I went ahead, went ahead and did that for them. And that was actually like my first like paying client. I actually didn't even charge them. They ended up paying me, you know, like a little <laughs> like gratuity, a little, you know, like a little tip or something. And that's really when the spark really, you know, grew from there. Yeah. yeah, that's awesome. Well, I mean, you know, that's one of the biggest challenges. I, you know, I meet with a lot of young designers and things and finding new business is one of their biggest issues, you know, and for a lot of creatives, you know, people are are generally a little bit introverted or, you know, maybe don't feel or see themselves as like a salesperson. So the fact that you were able to go out and actually position yourself this way and establish relationships early on that would later come back and help you out is a, you know, a really good indicator or sort of speaks to your personality. Yeah, definitely. Art, tell us about your first web project. Cause that's different than just a logo or a quick flyer for a friend kind of thing that, that entails scope creep. <laughs> oh yeah. A lot of scope creep. <laughs> if you don't control it properly. Yeah. But, um, but yeah, so I, like I said, I started with like logo design and eventually I found myself really liking the online stuff, you know, creating websites and learning all the principles and psychology, and how people interact with the web versus something printed in your hand. And, uh, my first web project, um, I honestly don't, I can't even remember. I've done so many websites, right. <laughs> uh, but in, I want to say the first, first website that I did, uh, was probably my own portfolio site, honestly, with just my branding work sure. uh, that I could remember. I honestly can't even remember my first project, but uh, it was from there. And I'd always test things on my own projects and my own, my own stuff first before trying out on my clients. Yeah. Yeah. No, that makes sense. I think that's how a lot of people get going. Um, talk a little bit, I mean, do you have, this is something we ask a lot. Some people don't want to get into it or not, but, um, do you have any horror stories? Like, do you have, I mean, do you have that one client that you struggled with the most and, and how did you overcome that? I mean, yeah, most um, freelancers and designers and stuff have a few have of them, but, so, but I'm just curious. Yeah. I think honestly, when, it, when you say like horror stories, I feel like the worst ones are always the ones that have to deal with money. Yeah, <laughs> I don't yeah. think it gets any scarier than that really. Right. Yeah. And uh, so in the beginning, I really had a lot of like trouble, like getting payments on time and all that sort of stuff. And so when I first started, I was actually getting, um, you know, a lot of people were, I would design first and then get paid after. And a lot of times when I don't know the person or where they're coming from, or how they heard about me, um, I would, you know, wouldn't get paid for months, you know, I have to keep chasing them down. And so that was like probably one of the biggest horror stories is that dealing yeah. with is getting paid, you know, and so I, well, I think that's a, a really important thing to, to touch on, especially for young designers and, and people who are just sort of getting their legs, you know, for, for, you know, not just invoicing money, but collecting money. Um, you know, having that money conversation up front is really key. And most people at least don't want to do it. Yeah. Don't want to have that. Don't want to have that conversation. <laughs> yeah. And so, I mean, was that a problem for you or did you always feel pretty comfortable asking for money? Um, I've always been really transparent with all my clients and all my projects that I work on. So for me to talk about money, like I just felt like I was doing them a favor and doing me a favor, you know what I mean? By putting it on the table, like this is how much what you're asking for is going to cost X amount of dollars, you know, to either you have it or you don't have it. If you don't have it, then we have to kind of adjust. So it fits the budget that you guys have in place. So I always felt like, you know, making, I learned that lesson really quick and uh, I adjusted pretty quickly too. Yeah, that's awesome. I know so many people that have been at this for, for quite a long time who still just struggle with that, you know. Uh, I think, you know, to, your, to the point you made about sort of that you were actually doing your clients a favor by being transparent and telling them up front what it was going to cost. Mm -hmm. um, I think that that's one of those things that because, you know, freelancers, contractors, people like that are generally a little bit timid about money, they don't bring it up until the end. And so when, you know, client shows up, says, hey, I love the work you did, and then they get hit with this fat bill, um, it kind of comes out of nowhere. And so that creates this contention and makes it difficult for clients to want to pay you. And so I think, you know, not only was it, you know, pretty mature as a young guy to, to do that, but also, um, you know, just to have that skill set in place, you know, from the jump is, is so key. So yeah. now that you're not doing it, well, you, you might still be doing quite a lot of logo work, but your focus is mainly on websites, right? Is that correct? Yeah. Yeah, that's correct. I treat the, the logo design and the branding more as like a, if you absolutely need it, like if I'm designing a website and you have no logo or you have a really bad logo that doesn't work with the website, then I'll always put that in and kind of say like, hey, we should work on your branding as well. And I go as far as social media, everything that they need for to be branded properly. So what's your initial consult with the client like when you sit down to discuss their needs for a website? What, what do you normally go through and walk through with the client before you even start? And then... 
is your billing, is that kind of an overall billing or is it an hourly based thing or how, how do you kind of get started with that with them? Yeah, to answer that question quickly, uh, it's just talking about, uh, I just talk, talk to them really like about the project and the results that the project they're trying to get and kind of base the pricing off of that. I don't really do like hourly unless it's like something so small that I might do hourly or I might just not bill it at all if it's something quick, honestly. Yeah, um, sometimes the billing's harder than the actual job. You do something that takes like 10 minutes and then you want to bill for a whole hour. It just doesn't yeah. really make sense, you know? Yeah. But uh, yeah, so I do like project based, kind of project and value based kind of fuse together. Um, that's kind of how I go up, come up with like pricing for stuff. Um, yeah. And then also to, um, what was the first part of the question again? I forgot. <laughs> oh, it's just like trying to figure out what your initial consult is like with the client and how you describe the value based pricing versus the hourly, why, why they would want to go that route. Because I know a lot of clients are like, okay, 100 bucks an hour. 50 hours, you know, whatever the total is kind of thing. It, it makes sense to them versus the value-based pricing, which is Christo's kind of mantra, right? Yeah. And you've kind of adopted that now, right? Well, yeah. And actually one of the stars in the value-based pricing movement is right there in Providence. So, I mean, now you've moved away, but, uh, but he was nearby. <laughs> this guy, Jonathan Stark, he's one of the, okay. one yeah, of the I've guys heard of sort of leads that charge, but he's, uh, he's right there in Providence. Yeah, I've heard of Chris. Though. I watch a lot of his content on YouTube. He actually did kind of introduce to me a little bit of like the value-based pricing. And also it's like a book, uh, Win Without Pitching Manifesto that he talks yeah, about all the right. time. I've yeah. read that book. That book has transformed my business completely from <laughs> yeah, how no, I think great. about what I do. Yeah. Yeah. For people who don't know it, it's basically, I mean, it's a pretty quick little read. It's, I mean, maybe less than a hundred pages. It's not a, not a real long book, but it's basically 12 keys to running your business as a creative freelancer or as a contract worker. And uh, I mean, it's, it's simple, but it's brilliant. Yeah, definitely. I would agree. So, yeah. And that one's by a guy named Blair ends. If anybody wants to look him up. I'll have to check yeah. So uh, yeah, no, so that's great. But yeah, I mean, I just, I mean, like I said, I've been in a biz in business for a long time, but I mean, we've just started to try and make the transition into a value based pricing model from doing hourly for a decade. And uh, you know, it's, it's, been i mean it's been a, a tough process but it's totally worth doing uh chris doe has been on this podcast he was one of our our guys and actually I, I may see him this weekend but we're uh but he sort of has helped you know get me on track to do that value-based pricing and just sort of changes the the way that you deal with clients i think it's really good information and i just wish i'd have come up with, you know landed on that kind of stuff 15 <laughs> years ago before i before yeah. i did it the hard way for all this time yeah i agree also too with like time-based like like billing through like hours and all that stuff like i feel like it's all about like how fast can you get it done you know what i mean so i can get yeah, the mm -hmm. best price on it and so when you take away that dynamic of, of the conversation and it's about right, what are the results then it changes the whole the whole relationship the whole project overall you know yeah, you no, get a better end product yeah it's so true and um, as a freelancer as somebody who's working by the hour i mean it doesn't behoove you to work very you know quickly i mean like yeah. obviously you're going to make more money if you can kind of drag your feet you know so why why be fast why be good you know so it sort of de-incentivizes you know designers and, and people like that so i think it's a really good model to step away from i also think honestly clients appreciate it i mean like the way we do it we give sort of a flat package rate you know mm -hmm. so it's going to be this amount of money period there's no wishy-washy there's no maybe we go over it's this is what it yeah, costs exactly same here. and then um you know we are also to, uh, trying to and it sounds like and this might be a good segue into some of these other questions that we've got for you but um the we we tend to biz, uh, base things on some sort of measurable business metric and it's funny because that seems like a, a very common idea like for business people but for creative people, most people are creative first, business people second, third, fourth, fifth. And so yeah, they, they often don't even really think about that. They just go, oh, well, what looks great? Or what do I think would communicate this in a good way based on my artistic experience? But it's you know, generally pretty tough to come up with, a, with an ROI against somebody's gut feeling. And yeah, so, so doing this project-based uh, uh, pricing, the way that we're talking about and actually setting it up against some sort of measurable business metric is something that at least in my experience, our clients are appreciating uh, because now they can actually see, you know, their money's going, they got more business. Cool. It worked. <laughs> you know, like yeah. now we can measure it and say, you know, versus in the past when we would just do a website because somebody came to us and said they needed one. 
Yeah, or even worse too, like sometimes the client will drive everything that goes on the website and there's no consideration at all to a strategy or a goal to the website or just nothing. Yeah, Yeah. (laughs) exactly. Yeah, no, it's one of these things that it's like, it's in the ether that everyone should have a website, therefore I must have one. But they don't actually even think about what they're supposed to do with it. So I guess maybe on that topic, why don't we get into some of these questions? So uh, the first thing I wanted to ask is sort of why should the digital landscape be a part of a company's marketing plan? I think uh, the idea here is that, you know, you need to have a broader idea of what's happening in technology and what's happening in the market before you actually go forward. This is, you know, back to the, to what we were just saying about people not actually planning or thinking ahead. What are your thoughts on that? Yeah, I think, you know, 2019, if you're not online, then you're not even a part of the conversation. You're not even in the same room <laughs> as the people yeah. having the conversation. And so I think that's like a, the simple answer to that. Yeah, no, it makes sense. And and I think that's the thing. I mean, obviously being online is key and, you know, but like, I don't know if it's as bad now, but there was a little window there where, you know, every 26 year old that knew how to run Twitter became a social media expert and <laughs> they would run out and they'd convince these companies that they had to have it. And it's not that maybe you shouldn't be on social media. I mean, obviously, I mean, there's a lot of arguments for why you should be on social media, but I do think it's interesting, just like you were saying about websites, a lot of people don't know why they're just going there because, oh, well, it's free to be on Twitter. So I guess I should be on Twitter. Yeah. And so uh, do you have any thoughts on that in terms of like the, you know, just in, in uh, the overarching landscape or digital landscape, um, you know, choosing a channel or choosing a platform, like what, what kind of motivators would you encourage in your clients to try and pick a channel? Well, the first thing is like the reason why the website comes into play with all that is because I like to think of the website as a plate and everything that you do, every digital marketing service that you do for your business is a, is a, like, is a, is a, an item or, you know, peas or mashed potatoes or whatever you want on your plate. Right. So the website is really the plate and without the plate, you're not really having any, you're not going you're gonna to look like a crazy person with all this food in your hands rather than <laughs> a plate, you know? And so like people pay for like LinkedIn ads or Facebook ads and all this stuff, but people at the end of the day, they're going to go back to your website and look at your website. And so I feel like you're cutting your results a lot shorter when you don't have a website in place, when you do all these other digital marketing tactics, but then the website is just, you know, lackluster for a better yeah. Well, and that's the thing too. I mean, back to having an overarching strategy or having some understanding of why you're actually creating a website. I mean, typically you're using social media to engage people and hopefully drive them drive to, to the some, website. well, to somewhere yeah, anyway. Yeah. And so, I mean, you kind of have to have somewhere, you know, so in, in, to use your metaphor, if they don't have this dish to land on, then where are they going to go? They're just going to go float out in the ether somewhere. Man, you know, in, in which case, I mean, customers. yeah. So, uh, yeah, I think that that's, uh, I think that's a good point. So, um, do you dabble with the SEO at all? Or is that kind of not your specialty? You're just in the design world. Um, yeah, SEO, I don't really dabble much into it. I um, have partners that I work with that have specialties in different things and SEO is one of them. And so, um, but I, I'm able to do the basics, you know, like meta tags, title tag, page stuff, you know, page titles and all that stuff. Um, sure. The basics of it, just to get like what Google needs at the bare minimum, you know? Um, but in terms of SEO, that's a, a, a different tactic that I would partner with somebody else on. Sure. Yeah, no, that makes sense. So what do you think are three small details of a website that can make a big impact on a potential client? You know, most people, I mean, obviously strategy is one of these big ones, but what are the, the little things that people don't think of that might help make their website perform a little better? Yeah, there's a, there's a bunch of stuff, but one thing is uh, having like a lot of social proof on your website. Um, and what that basically means is uh, having other like case studies or video testimonials or written testimonials on the website, uh, just because all the people we're social creatures, you know what I mean? We, we get persuaded off of emotion most of the time when it comes to like buying a product, we believe we're being a part of a, part of a, a tribe or a culture when we buy a product, you know, when we buy like AirPods, we're getting inducted into that Apple, uh, environment, right? That culture that Apple has. And so. The same thing, um, you know, when it comes with social proof, you want to feel good about the purchase that you made. And so that's something that I would definitely have, make sure uh, to have on a website and can really make uh, a website perform a lot better. Just having that, that's one thing. Um, also, another thing too is having the website be light enough where it can load on a mobile device. That's another thing. These are not like any particular uh any particular order or anything. Sure. No, I think it's all good advice. I mean, especially for people who are totally unschooled and, and, you know, might be coming to this, you know, as, as we mentioned before we got on air, uh, a lot of the people who listen to this show are entrepreneurs or small business owners, people like that, people who are looking to do as much as they can on their own 
generally, you know, they're trying to bootstrap and, and figure out how to do things on a, on as small a budget as they can. So they may want to try and do a few things themselves, you know, so I think this kind of thing is great. So if you've got maybe a couple more, you'd be willing to share, that'd be awesome. Yeah. You know, like I was saying, uh, make the website basically, uh, light enough where it can load properly on any device on a, on a mobile device. Cause you got to think about your phone, you know, you're using a data versus connected to a Wi-Fi. Uh, so it's not going to be as fast. So you want to make sure that even somebody that's not connected to Wi-Fi can, can the website load on. Um, also on top of it, you know, loading fast on mobile is uh, the way that your website looks on mobile. You know, are the buttons big enough? Are they clickable? Is the text too small? Is it too big? Those sort of things. Scale accordingly, does it? Exactly. Yeah. You know, because if you're looking at a whole page that's like designed for a monitor versus your small iPhone, if it doesn't scale accordingly, it's hard to navigate and get around. Sometimes you can't even do navigate and get around. Yeah, like some um, certain things are blocked, you can't get to it. You know, so many issues sometimes. Your image sizes are another thing. If you have full high def images and it takes forever to load, uh, that drops down on your SEO results as well. Mm -hmm. So um, why would someone want to come to someone like you versus try and do it themselves? Um, um, I think one of the main things is just uh, that I'm agile, you know, that I'm able to, to be very flexible and work with the customer versus like big corporate companies where you got to go through multiple different channels, multiple different things. Like with me, when you call me or when you email me or when you get in contact with a project for me to work on with you, you're getting me and I'm able to just move fluidly like with whatever the customer needs. Yeah, no, I think that makes sense. Well, and, and I don't know, maybe you can get a little bit more into this, but what do you think are the factors that might like, I guess if I'm a small business owner and I'm trying to make the decision, whether I continue going it on my own or if I wanted to engage somebody like you to do the work, um, you know, do you have any idea of some of the kinds of factors or things that people are weighing before they go in? I mean, I, I would guess cost is one, but I mean, can you speak to any of the sorts of things that, you know, might be indicators that it's time to uh, engage a professional? Um, I think the biggest thing is just the, the, like I mentioned before, the behaviors of how people use the internet. Um, so when I work on a project, the best projects are the ones that I collaborate directly with the business owner himself, because nobody knows your business better than you. And so, I feel like when you merge the, the business owner's expertise about their industry or their business and how it runs with the mind of a person like myself uh, that knows like the, the psychology and the, the behaviors of how people use the internet and how to build websites effectively to get um, your point across and also to get, you know, boost sales and, and actually get results. Uh, it creates like a perfect medley there. Yeah, no, I think that makes sense. Uh, I mean, it's, I know I deal with people all the time who are either premature, so they're coming to me without a plan, without a strategy, they don't even know why they need a website, or you get people who've maybe toughed it out too long. So I think it's really important to kind of identify when is the right time to, to pull the trigger. Um, I think time, honestly, is the biggest indicator. Like if you just literally don't have the time, you know, uh, you, you're going out, you're managing relationships, you're managing customers, um, and then on top of that, you're managing a website and branding and all that stuff. Like I feel like that's the biggest indicator is just time when you don't have the time to do that stuff or you rather just work on the business rather than, than in it, you know? Yeah. Do you do hosting for them or do you just uh, say, Hey, I'll do the design and you guys are responsible for the hosting and the name servers and the domain management. Yep. And I take care of everything. Uh, when I do websites, I do like maintenance plans after once it's live and launched. And so basically like if you have any issue with the website or you want to make updates to the website, I do that pretty much within one or two business days and pretty quick about that. Um, but also uh, we go as far as pretty much anything, anything technical. So it includes the hosting as well, setting up the hosting, setting up emails, pretty much anything that has to do with, with that. And then also when it comes to the branding portion, I can also print uh, marketing collateral too. So it's really a all, you know, one and done type of thing. I try to uh, have as much services, for the customer so they don't have to go out and shop around too much. They, they just go to me for everything that they would need and it gets done. Nice. Yeah, that's awesome. So let's take a step back. You mentioned earlier that sometimes you have companies come to you that don't have, you know, branding or logos or anything in place, at, you know, by the time they come to you, let alone a, a web strategy or some, some understanding why they need to be online. But can you talk about why branding and logo design is so important for a small business or a startup? I know, I mean, at least in my experience here in Salt Lake, we work with a lot of startups and things like that. And, you know, a lot of these tech guys, they don't, they don't put any thought 
to the branding. You know, really that comes later. You know, mm -hmm. at first they're trying to build technology and then they're trying to get money and they're trying to do this and that. But sometimes the, you know, the branding or the logo design is sort of given uh, short shrift, you know. So can you talk about why that's such an important component of a business? Um, I think it's pretty simple. Like one of the main reasons branding is important is because if you're inconsistent with your branding, you lose trust psychologically from customers. Like if you go to like a restaurant and they have like a little like paper sign on the door, or they have like a little like raggedy little menu or something that they just printed off the copy machine. It, then you it, know it's going to be legit. <laughs> yeah, you, you know, yeah, that, that works with Mexican food, I think. Yeah. Well, it depends right, where you're at. For the most part, for the most part, no worries. Uh, for the most part, when you uh, when you see that type of stuff, uh, it throws up the customer off. And so, by being branded, uh, it makes you uh, gain trust as the easy way possible, as easy, the easiest way possible uh, with your customers, just by looking a certain way, looking clean and polished. Well, even just a color palette, you know, like if you have the four colors that are the business identity and you, exactly. you stick to that, that's your brand guidelines. That's your stuff that most people would kind of overlook. Don't well, even and that's the thing. I, I think to, uh, to your point, this, you know, basically it's consistency, you know, I mean, you don't see like, you know, Nike has just been running out with this swoosh thing all these years. But, you know, tomorrow they're going to just start using triangles or something. You know? Like, I mean, like yeah. it wouldn't make sense. Like that'd be a break in, in the consumer confidence and in the trust of the brand because we've come, you know, become accustomed to it. Yeah. So I think uh, I think that's a really good point. Do you think or have you noticed that, you know, sort of as technology's improved, you know, everybody's got a cousin that knows Photoshop nowadays. Like there are a lot of people like uh, there's almost no excuse to not have a brand of some variety anymore. And I wonder if because it's so much more accessible now that it's leading to sort of bad branding. So like, yes, you have a logo. Yes, you have stuff, but you're not being intentional. You're not thinking of the, the way the audience is perceiving you. You don't have like, for example, like Mike said, a color palette or something it's in, you know, mm -hmm. figured out. So like, how do you tell good from bad, I guess? So if I, you know, if I go and trust my cousin to build me out a logo, you know, how do I know that it's good or bad? Yeah, so I think uh, a good logo is just a logo that's simple, it's unique, and it's memorable. You know, that's really how you would know, um, you know, because a, a good logo should speak for your company when you're not there. So when you see it on a, on a bag or you see it on a notebook or you see it just anywhere, the, the audience that it's intended for should be able to see that logo and, and know what the company is about before they even say anything, before they even go to the website. And so I feel like that's really what makes a good logo. Um, but also too having it, you know, like you mentioned, like the palette, the color palette, the typography, having a whole entire branding kit created for that. So it doesn't move from, you know, the, the original design that was created for the company. Cause sometimes you get a logo done and then you'll see something else that the, the boss or the owner just wanted to make on his own. That doesn't even look like the company at all, you know? And so I feel like well, that's, that's what makes it good. Yeah. And it's funny too. Like, I, I mean, I've been working with, you know, several clients even, even now that, you know, are pretty mature companies. And even for these more mature companies, they still, you know, a couple of them anyway, don't have brand guidelines and things like that. And it seems like such a no brainer, but for whatever reason, it doesn't occur to people that you really need to define all this stuff. Yeah. Especially when you hand off, you know, the, the assets for like the, the branding, um, to other people, you know, that's when it's super key because then they, they know what to do with it. They know what fonts to get, they know what colors to use. But when you don't have that, that's when all that inconsistency starts happening. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it makes sense. So I guess, you know, so sort of to that end, we talked about a bad brand, but can you talk about what a, what a bad website is and how business owners can avoid having one? Don't um, hire me to do it. That's <laughs> <laughs> I think uh, what, what makes a bad website really is uh, just a website that isn't clear. You know, there's all these different things distracting them to do a million and one different actions. Um, for example, like a call to action should be one call to action on what's the main primary objective that you want the user to do on the website. Whether that's an email list or whether it's to simplify customer service or to get in contact with that, with that business, um, the, the call to action should be very simple. Um, but, you know, so if it's overcrowded, it's just a bad website, if it, uh, isn't branded with the branding or anything like that or no logo, just a random color palette for the website. Uh, that also is a bad website. If it doesn't load fast, it's a bad website. Um, if it just focuses on the business and what they've done, I think that's a bad website. A good website will always focus on their customers, their pain points, 
um, and also like the, the benefits of using the product rather than just the features of the product. Because features is just talking about the materials and how this is made in 30 years in business and all that sort of stuff. But the benefits is like, what do I get as the customer from using your product or service? You know, and I feel like a lot of business owners miss that mark with their website. Yeah, it's true. I think it's really easy for companies to become a little bit, uh, you know, self-centered or start looking at their needs. Yeah, because, you know, they, <laughs> they know that what they have is the best thing ever. So, I mean, here we don't, we don't necessarily need to focus the message to somebody else. Just, well, it, you know, it's also hard to take that step outside of you and look into the business as the customer would and have hiring someone that isn't part of the business, someone like you that can take that objectively and then go from there versus... I'm the CEO and I'm trying to build a website. I'm going to, you know, it, exactly. Yeah. yeah. My nephew's going to build it and we're just going to do it. Yep. So, so. Yeah, no, that's for sure. So let's um, transition a little bit. Um, I guess, first of all, so it, I, it's not really a full blown role play, but I want to kind of go through this journey a little bit just so that people understand what they can expect when they try and engage somebody like you. So first, if, if I'm Joe Consumer and I, I've got my own little small business and I'm looking to engage somebody, you know, like you said, I'm, I'm out of time. I, you know, can't keep spending resources on this stuff. My days just aren't long enough. You know, so what qualifications should I look for in a web developer or a web design company? Um, I think, honestly, you should just look at their case studies or even if they don't have like formalized like case studies, just ask about like the past three projects or past five projects that they worked on and what results and how that project went and, and that sort of stuff. Before you start working on my project, I would look at projects that you've done for other people. That's what I would look for in a web developer. And, and how, see, do, how, like, if you don't know anything about the technology, is there any clear way to understand whether somebody is a proficient programmer or proficient developer outside of maybe just the aesthetics? Maybe you're a great designer, but you can't build a website. Yeah, because there is, there is a disconnect there. You know, someone can be a great designer, but not know, you know, outside of WordPress, you know, how, how would you develop a custom solution for the client that if you can't find a plugin in WordPress or something to that extent? How yeah. can they kind of figure out that you have what they need? Yeah, I personally, when I talk to customers, I never really focus on the technology. Like they might mention something like, oh, are you going to be building it on WordPress? I'll say, yeah. Or, or if they don't want it on WordPress, then we do it that way as well. But more of the conversation like of, of uh, showing past results is like the results themselves. That's what the conversation is all about. Like the fact that this customer wanted this result that you achieved or not with the, web, with the past web design product that you worked on. And so it's always about results. It's not really, I don't talk much about technology wise, unless it's like when the website's done and they want to be able to manage the website on themselves, I'll do a little bit of training on how to manage the back end. That's like as far as it goes for the most part of me. Well, personally. and I think, you know, now that you say that, I think that's a really good point, you know, because I, I think if you get too caught up in the technical side, you know, people maybe start to kind of glaze over and, you know, go, you know, they don't stick with you because they don't understand the conversation at all. They're just yeah. coming to you as a trusted provider to deliver. You know, they don't really care how you do it. Just do it. Yeah, exactly. That's exactly the, what I was trying to say. Cool. That makes sense. Okay. So let's say then I'm back to being Joe consumer and I've got my little small business. I've decided to engage you. I like your case studies. I like the work you're doing for other people. And it makes sense to me that you guys, that you could do a good job for me. You know, what's that process look like from when I, when I initially engage with you through discovery design, all these different components. Can you talk a little bit about just the process of employing, you know, it can be your process or just the process of sort of working with a professional in this space. Yeah. Um, you know, I, uh, first I, I, first, when I, we schedule like a, an appointment basically for me just to understand their business and understand the problems and why they think they need a website. Cause you'll, you'll come to find this as well. Like where a lot of people think they have all these problems, but really it's a lot deeper, bigger mm -hmm. issues, you know? And so we, that's what the first conversation is always about. It's about that. Um, and then some also at the same time, I'm interviewing them as well to see if it's a good fit for me to work with them as well. Yeah, um, so it's kind of, it's both ways, it's both ways because uh, sometimes some clients just don't end up working well for whatever reason. And uh, usually that's the cutting point where it will happen. Um, but if then if I, if I see that it's been a good match, good conversation, it's a problem that I can actually help with. Um, we'll move on to like the next step, which is, uh, you know, contract invoicing, all that stuff. And then uh, we get into the strategy and understanding deeper from a company level. Um, what are, what are the strategies that they have? Uh, what are the weaknesses that they have currently and how can the website strengthen those weaknesses and also understanding internally, how do they intake customers? Do they have a call center? Do they have different things so that the website can go hand in hand and hand off the, the potential leads uh, to the call center 
or whatever system they have internally for how they handle customers. That makes sense. Um, do you use a CRM or, or what software do you use for invoicing and um, payment? Um, honestly, I've been using the same stuff uh, since uh, 2010, which is uh, I've just been using PayPal just ah, because it has everything that I need in it, uh, recurring uh, invoices, you know, sending out branded invoices, all that stuff. And the percentage is about the same anyways, what they take. So I just ended up using that and I still am. That works. Yeah, nothing wrong with PayPal. I love it. Um, can you talk about, you, you mentioned one thing in that sort of little rundown that I think is key. And I think it's something that a lot of younger designers and, and people like that may not, and, and even if you're honestly not even a designer, but you are in a service business or you're working with clients, um, it makes sense to, to approach things this way. The word you, you, that you use that I keyed in on was interviewing, you're interviewing your clients. Yes. I think a lot of people, especially when they're young and they're hungry and they're just, you know, they got to make some money. Um, they have this proclivity to just take on a client regardless. You know, it doesn't matter who they are, or what they are, or even if it looks like it might be a little bad, you know, we're still desperate enough, uh, enough to take that money. Um, can you talk a little bit about how you transitioned or how you got comfortable getting to a stage where you had enough confidence to actually sit down and interview your clients and be willing to tell somebody no? Yeah. Um, I always position myself that way. Like every time when, when I get like a, like a, somebody who fills out the contact form or something, I always word it in a very specific way. Like, let's see if this is going to be a good fit. So number one, right off there as an indicator saying that yeah, I don't, I just don't take out, take every single project that comes my way. Um, but also the way that I just word it is, you know, that we're trying to figure out if this is going to work, you know, because uh, in the beginning I used to take a lot, like every project that would come my way because I did truly need the money at that, at that time. And even now I still need the money. Right. Yeah. But, uh, but um, yeah, so like I just realized that by me taking these lower paying jobs or these jobs that I just didn't feel comfortable taking, um, I'm losing opportunity to work with customers that um, have bigger budgets or, or actually are pleasant to work with. Sometimes you'll find that some customers like very, especially entrepreneurial people in general, sometimes can be a little bit aggressive or that alpha male persona sometimes and certain things just don't mesh up well, you know what I mean, for whatever mm -hmm. reason. And so um, it's an interview both ways, you know, and I, and I just, you know, I want to make sure that I can, I can deliver on the results that we discuss. Well, know? yeah, it's funny. Cause I mean, you know, with almost 100%, you know, certainty, like almost every person I know that has taken the approach you're describing, uh, where you're actually interviewing your clients, you're being somewhat exclusive. You're willing to tell somebody, no, um, everybody I know that's been brave enough to take that step in their career has always ended up better for it. You stop doing yeah. the you know, $20 an hour work and you move up to the $50 an hour work, you know, and you, and you sort of work your way through a career. I think a little bit of it, I mean, I almost feel like you have to have, you know, burned the midnight oil and gone through the, the struggles of an early career to understand that transition. Yeah. But I think the sooner you can get like this particular point, in, you know, or this case point in particular, uh, this idea that you should be exclusive and that you don't need to work for everybody, especially if you don't like them or if there's some, you know, some other red flag that you don't like. Um, you, you absolutely should be able to tell somebody no. And, and I think that, you know, the sooner you can get to that in the career, the better off you are. Yeah. It's hard yeah. to, to sit back and realize that, you know, not every client's the client or worth even pursuing. Cause sometimes that X amount of dollar check isn't worth the, the effort that you have to put into it. And we've all been down there and we've all had those clients where you're three quarters of the way along and you're pulling your ha hair out and you just can't wait till the delivery date just to get it out and not have to deal with it anymore. <laughs> Never get another email from them again. <laughs> Be like, okay, I'm done. <laughs> yeah. So just get there. Go. <laughs> well, and like you mentioned earlier on, and I think actually Mike brought it up was this idea of scope creep. I think that, you know, for people who don't know, basically this is the idea of, you know, the project you bidding, you know, sort of starting to exceed the bounds of what you quoted. And it's really common. It happens a ton in marketing and advertising. I assume it happens in other businesses like general contracting. I mean, if you're building a house, I imagine that it's really easy for the scope to creep a little bit if you're not. Yeah. Yeah. And so, uh, so I think it's really important that, you know, this interviewing process is one aspect of that, that I think uh, can contribute or sort of help rein in some scope creep because you have a good relationship. You have somebody you can talk to open and honestly, you've been transparent from the beginning. And, uh, and I think ultimately that leads to a better relationship. Those people are a little less likely to screw you over, I think. Yeah, and, and the other thing too, you kind of mentioned a little bit too, is like, it is a relationship, you know, and I, and I treat, I'm very transparent with all my clients. Like if, if 
you know, I advise them on a lot of different things when it comes to like the website, what they should do, what they shouldn't do. And because I treat it such like a relationship that like, I don't want to just take every single project, even ones that didn't mesh well, and then, you know, not be able to really care for them the way that they should be just because for some reason it just didn't work out. But with, uh, with customers, like, you know, it's in, I'm in it for the long term. You know, when I build a website, I want to be treated like that, that in-house guy that, that it's like your in-house design team in a way, you know, so mm-hmm. we really become almost like a family in a way. Yeah, no, I love that perspective. I mean, especially this idea of looking sort of at the long term. I think back to our example of the the young designer or the young, you know, service contractor, whatever we want to call them so we can be inclusive of everyone. But the uh, the young designers who are taking on clients that they don't like, most of them are thinking very short term. They're thinking, hey, I've just got a product. They they have cash. I can do the job. Let's just knock it out and be finished. And And they're not really thinking, you know, further down the line into – this sort of long form relationship space that, you know, that you're describing. And I think that, you know, ultimately, I mean, that's something we realized in our business early on is this idea of, of developing good quality relationships is much more valuable than, you know, on, on both financial and the sort of personal fronts, you know, it's much more valuable to have clients that you love and that you're sort of familial with versus a bunch of short term gigs that are just in and out and gone. and Don't, care. don't remember you the next week. <laughs> yeah. Well, and ultimately it doesn't behoove you as a contract person, you know, if somebody employs your agency and the experience they had with you was so quick and short and dirty that they just, they, you know, that doesn't help get you referrals. That doesn't help get you, you know, your name spread positively. That doesn't, I mean, it doesn't actually do you any good to go do a kind of a crappy job for somebody or kind of bust through something fast just because. Exactly. Yeah. And so, and I think most people, especially young people don't realize that, you know, cause they don't have these problems until later when they've been in their career for 15 years yet, nobody is talking about them. Yeah. Or you build like a whole uh, portfolio of like clients that you don't like working with and then you got <laughs> to keep on working with them just to pay the bills, you know? <laughs> yeah, it's true. It's almost, I mean, it's, it's one of these things that I'm always telling my kids, you know, if you believe you can, or if you believe you can't, you're right. It's mm-hmm. sort of this magnetism, right? It's this idea that, you know, if you if you work with bad clients perpetually and you become known as the guy that works with this type of client, well, then you're going to attract more of that type of client. You know, you really yeah. need to be, you know, setting goals and aspirations to try and win business from people you actually want to work with, whether it's on a philosophical level or, a, you know, whatever bit of that person's business or that company that you admire, you know, you, you need mm-hmm. to sort of actually think about that and try and be a little bit more lofty in your goals instead of just taking every scrub that comes by. Was it uh, Ben Burns that fired his whole clients? Uh, everyone yeah. like, it, yeah, yeah. I, I think I saw that. Yeah. Yeah. He, <laughs> like we were joking. Well, what'd you do? Just send a mass email and say, peace, we're done. <laughs> but I mean, like sometimes that, that is a kind of a necessity. Like if you're getting the, the $20 an hour clients and you're looking for the hundred dollar an hour clients, they're not going to be associating with those people. You know, like if you keep yeah. taking them on, taking them on, they're not going to refer you to the better paying clients, the clients that you actually want. They're, yeah, that's so gonna, true. Yeah. But anyways, well, I, I, well, and I think there's the aspect of that too, you know, I mean, whether it comes to such a dire moment or such a desperate moment as Ben described where he, you know, basically had to fire all his clients. Or if you're just a young person or a young designer or a young company trying to come up, you know, I mean, if you want the Pepsis of the world, you know, Pepsis don't hire $25 an hour agencies. They just don't, you know, I mean, they're hiring expensive shops with big brands and big reputations and things like that. Like if you want to work for the big guys, then you have to grow and become a big guy, you know? And so if you spend too much time with bad clients and not working on your business practices and developing, you know, good clientele and good rapport and, you know, developing those relationships, those ever important relationships, You know, then when you do want to do work for the Pepsis or whomever, you're just, you're not ready. I should probably stop saying Pepsi because I'm drinking (laughs) Fresca's. I bet you they're owned by the same. (laughs) No, no, this is a Coke product. Oh, crap. We're on on the good side. So when I said Pepsi, bleep that out. Call it Coke. (laughs) So, so anyway, well, so let's talk a little bit. um, I mean, these are sort of some, some top level things. um, But like, I mean, can you give us just a couple reasons or purposes that somebody might need a website or might want one? I mean, we address the idea that, you know, it's 2019, like get with it already. Yeah. But, um, but outside of that, like, why would I actually want a website? What are the, the things I can do with one these days? Uh, I think honestly, the reason why you want a website is because it can equal more money in your pocket as a business owner. Uh, people, they're going to check you out online. They're going to look at reviews about your business. It's going to, you're going to be, whether you have a website or not, people are going to look for you online. And it's either you're going to be online to defend your case or, or not. You know? <laughs> 
<laughs> yeah, no, I, I think that that's a good way of putting it. Because, yeah, that's the thing, right? I mean, either you can have your own website so people can come straight to the horse's mouth or they're going to hear, hear about you from other channels. And so, yeah. but either way, you're online. What, what's the benefits of having your own site versus like a Facebook page or a Squarespace site or something to that extent? Why would you want to have your own? Yeah, I wouldn't, I've seen that a few times where people just point a domain name to like a Facebook page. But the thing is like, that's super templated. People always talk about templates are bad. That's like the mega template right there, you know? <laughs> um, and also too, like if Facebook goes away, guess what? Your website goes away, you know? Yeah. Um, but I think the, what those templated, uh, I, those, you know, like Squarespace and Wix and all these different guys that are out there, um, I think you're just not getting the strategy. You know, you're saving tons and tons of money by doing the website yourself, but I think you're not, um, you're focusing, you're probably going to focus on yourself as a business and not think about your customers and not portray that on your website. Just the overall strategy of like uh, getting the person who goes on your website to do something so that they can reach out to you so you can carry the conversation from there, thus, you know, uh, creating a sale or, or, or a lead or something from there. Um, and continue the relationship from, from that point on. Well, yeah, but if you don't I, have a website, that, that can't happen. Yeah, I think the, the kind of the point you're making is, is this idea that, you know, it's not that they're hiring you necessarily. I mean, tactically, you're building a website. But strategically, you're, you're offering so much more than just a website, you know, and this kind of goes yeah. back to our value-based proposition and our, our idea of uh, sort of billing projects versus uh, hourly. But it's sort of this concept that, you know, you're actually the value that you bring isn't even actually that you can build the website. Like that tactical execution is like, it's great. Like that's the frosting on the cake or that's the, the, the end of this discussion. But it, you know, all this strategy and all this planning that comes in, you know, ahead of time is actually what you're buying. You're buying our experience, you're buying our brains, you're buying our thought processes, uh, those sorts of things that can actually make the thing you execute work. Yeah. Even when you hire a web designer, like there's millions of, thousands of web designers out there right um but what really what makes a good web designer from you know a bad one is uh you know the strategy i think strategy is even more important than design itself you know honestly because without the strategy you can't even design around anything you yeah, know no, and it's funny for for a long time just sort of as a lifelong designer like that that was a, a lesson that took me a long time to learn right i mean when you're working in a in an art department or you're working or you know surrounded by a bunch of other designers and stuff all the time you know, you start to get this idea that, well, what you're creating is the most important thing, right? I mean, it's the thing that people are seeing. And the example I always use is I, I once worked for an agency and we did a, a big website project for a global health or vision insurance company. And, uh, you know, this huge project, huge company, huge budgets, all this stuff, right? And for this one little tiny component of their website, we had like this $11 million budget. And I was like, oh, wow, you know, this is awesome. Like, you know, we're, we're making all this money. We're doing this stuff. And, you know, and me and all the designers, we're, we're cranking and we're building all these awesome, awesome designs and all this stuff, you know, and, and sparing no expense. We're doing focus groups. We're, we've got like rooms set up with cameras over people so we can see how they behave. You know, this, was, wow. yeah, yeah, this was years ago. So we yeah. had to do it a little stone age back then. So, <laughs> but we'd actually watch people and then change our prototype, you know, based on how they were moving mm-hmm. and stuff like that. You know, I mean, we went no, spared no expense. At the end of the day, we had billed about $375,000 for the website and the creative work. The other $11.7 million or $10.7 million went to the strategists and the planners who mm-hmm. had actually put together all the plan that we were executing. Yeah. And wow. so it's funny when you think about it that way, because as a designer, our inclination, and even as a web developer, if you're not thinking strategically, um, you know, we, we tend to think that what we're doing is the most important piece of the business. But to your point, the, the strategy or the planning behind it is actually the much more lucrative, much better and much more important part. Mm-hmm. You know, I mean, now granted, the strategy doesn't work if you don't have a nice execution. So, I mean, I guess it's maybe a, a yeah. chicken or the egg kind of discussion that you could have depending on who you're talking to. Well, but, did, who did we have on? Is it, we had an SEO expert on probably six months ago who had a client that he changed the layout of the button and put it in a different order and their sales increased by 30% or something. I can't remember his name, but that sounds pretty accurate. (laughs) Yeah. I mean, just like repositioning the button and getting rid of a few other things, they were able to increase the sales on the overall product by like 30 or 35% just by doing one simple thing. And it's amazing how just a psychological change like that can drive people through the actual process. So uh, it's strategic 
strategic planning is key. Strategery. Strategery. <laughs> <laughs> But, Even the yeah. colors too make a big difference. I've heard that uh, if you make like the call to action button orange, I think I forgot what the percentage is, but it's a big number. It goes up like yeah. for people actually clicking it because it pops so much from the. They can see it design. versus blending in. Yeah. yeah. Well, and it's funny. I mean, so to to I guess sort of put a cap on the point you were making about sort of that that we're buying the strategy and we're buying the experience or your consumer is versus actually buying the tactical execution, which is how you get away without talking about the technology. Yeah. Is that, um, you know, most people, like if you're building your own Wix website or you're building whatever, I mean, you could maybe do some research if you were really invested and figure out, you know, some mm -hmm. color theory and some other things like that. But generally you can just kick a guy like Melvin a couple bucks and this is the, the experience you get that helps guide some of these decisions. Because, mm -hmm. uh, you know, I mean, yes, he can build a website, but what you're actually buying is this knowledge, this background knowledge. Yeah, and also just collaborating and really picking the owner's brain and fusing that with, like, again, the behaviors of people online, you know, and really putting the, the, the customer, their customer first, because that's really who, who makes or breaks the website, right, is, is the customer, you know, is, yeah. is it working for them. Sure. Can you talk a little bit about, so as you're talking about picking the brains of your, your employee or your uh, employer or the boss or whomever is the sort of stakeholder in this website, can you talk to, uh, talk to the idea of sort of getting down to the bottom of what it is they actually are doing there? You mentioned it uh, at the top of the show, this idea that sometimes what they think is their problem isn't really their problem. Like it's actually something much deeper or something totally different. Um, you know, ha have you had any experience like that that you could sort of talk about or, or maybe sort of give some hints to, you know, how to, how to interface with a customer or a client and try and actually drive down to this why or figure out what their purpose is? Yeah, um, a lot, the, the most um, common one that I get a lot is uh, somebody will be stuck on like a Wix website or something or a Squarespace and they can't like scale the website, you know? And so they'll say, yeah, can you uh, log into our uh, Squarespace and do this and do that? And then when I'm looking at it, I'm like, there's no way you can't. This which, what the real problem is, is that you want a website that, that'll grow with your company. You did this when you guys were a small company and it worked then. And so that's just an example that I yeah. get a lot is that. Um, yeah, no, that makes sense. Well, well yeah, cool. go ahead, Mike. We're, we're almost to that point. Uh, do you want to tell people where they can find you and, uh, any parting shots that you have before we get out of here? Um, yeah. So if you are interested in working with me or you need a consultation of any kind, uh, you can reach me at www.mellowmultimedia.com and mellow spelled M E L L O multimedia.com. Yeah, that's awesome. And you said now you're in Florida, but you, uh, I, I mean, do you still have family in Rhode Island? Do you get back or is Florida the new HQ? Uh, Florida is the new HQ, definitely. Uh, it's a permanent move, but I, I worked with clients all over. I just finished doing a, an author's website based out of California. And he referred me to uh, a cover band that needs a website also in oh, California. Nice. So I, I'm all over the place. <laughs> <Nice>. <laughs> That's awesome. Cool. So, and then I also see here that you've got a YouTube channel. What kind of stuff do you do over there? Yeah, my YouTube channel and also my LinkedIn too. I, I put like a lot of like valuable tips on there. I try to make it quick, like videos that are like under two minutes just little tips and tricks that, that business owners can do to uh, improve like their website or their branding or stuff related to business, you know, and, and messaging towards their audience. Yeah, that's awesome. So yeah, so go uh, check it out. It's youtube.com slash mellow media, uh, mellow multimedia, uh, M E L L O multimedia dot. And uh, like he also mentioned, it's mellow media dot or ugh. good Lord, man. <laughs> Get it together, you know what? right? Mellow multimedia dot com. Uh, no <laughs> W on mellow. So, All right, well, cool. cool. All right. Well, thanks so much, uh, Melvin. We really appreciate your time. And I, I think the, the types of things that we talked about today, I think will be really valuable for our audience. So thanks for taking the time, man. Yeah, man. Thanks so much for having me. Yeah, really appreciate it. Of course. Take care. Thanks to everybody who tuned in for the, the live stream. We uh, are always on the hunt for more feedback from the community. So let us know what you thought of Melvin and, you know, I guess of our performance, although <laughs> keep, keep it to Melvin mostly. And, uh, um, you know, but anyway, questions, comments, any, anything you've got, send them in and, uh, and let us know. Uh, for people who didn't get to the show through our website, it's eggscast.com. You can also just shoot us an email, info eggscast.com or go to the contact form on the site. So I guess that's it. Sweet. So thanks so much again. Once again, uh, once again, Melvin Figueroa, uh, Mellow Multimedia is our guest and uh, we'll see you next time.